Proverbs, amen, and if you will, turn to Proverbs chapter 25. Uh, we are going to continue uh, with our Nuggets for Dad. This is Nuggets for Dad 7, and this is probably going to be the most scattered uh, of the ones that I've done so far. <clears throat> you say, what, what do you mean? <clears throat> well, this one, I'm going to... I'm going to hit a few things in it, and a couple of things that we may have done covered kind of overlap just a little bit, but uh, uh, just again, some just some random thoughts to try to help Dad. Uh, we're living in a day and age where where men don't seem to take responsibility anymore for their actions. Men don't take responsibility for and, and don't play the part. Amen. Uh, be the man, amen. They want, uh, our young people want to be called men. They want to be uh, respected like men, but they don't want to act like men. Amen. So I just want to try to help our young men today. There's too many homes that's got fatherless children. And I've got a heart for the kids, and it really breaks my heart to know uh, that, that, our young people don't have what it takes anymore. It, it amazes me how people can just walk away from their responsibility and it doesn't seem to bother them. If things break my heart and I watch other people uh, do, do, that, do something and it doesn't even seem to phase them. What's wrong with us? Have we grown so cold that nothing convicts us, nothing shames us anymore? But anyway, I am going to be uh, giving you some more nuggets for Dad. Uh, I, you say, how long are we going to do this series? I don't know. As long as the Lord keeps giving me something, I'll keep doing nuggets for Dad. And if the Lord gives me something on nuggets for Mom, I'll do something with nuggets for Mom. Amen. But anyway, uh, Proverbs 25, you should be there. Look at one verse. We'll look at verse 11. 25 verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. I don't know about you, but I'd like to have some apples of gold, amen? Uh, something very valuable, something very, very valuable and something uh, beautiful, amen, would be apples of gold and, and uh, uh, pitchers of silver. That is like a fitly word, a word fitly spoken. But anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and Turn to Isaiah 50. Hold your place there in Proverbs. We'll be back there in a little bit. But Isaiah 50 and verse 4. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. The first part of the verse is what I'm looking at. It says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. We're living in a day and age where our kids are bombarded with sexual images and sexual in, innuendo and all kinds of stuff. And, and so much is expected of our kids. We truly had it easy compared to our kids. I always was of the assumption that, well, sin, sin, it's the same thing. We face peer pressure. We face bullying. We faced all these different things that kids go through today. But I'm telling you, we didn't have to fight the news media, the TV programs, all pushing that immorality and that unbiblical lifestyle and the politically correct agenda that they've got pushed down their throats today. Right. It's a lot harder for them, amen? And dads is more, is more needed now than ever, amen? There's always, dad, you've always been needed, and when it seems like they need us the most is when they're failing, you know, I want to be there for my kids. I want to be there for my kids. I don't care if my kids are gone, married and everything. If one of my kids call me today, I'm gone. I'm going to be over there. I'm going to do whatever I can to help them. I, I want to be there for my children. Amen. But it, it bothers me to think that one of them would need me and I couldn't help them. Or I wouldn't help them. That just bothers me. And, and today it doesn't seem to bother people. But let me give you a few more things, Dad. Some things to help you. Just some little nuggets uh, that I've learned over the years that I've prayed about. Uh, I've learned some things and I, I've prayed, Lord, for wisdom. And now, now granted, I'm just going to be as honest as I can. I was not a perfect dad. I did not do everything right. But I'll tell you what I did do. 
I did learn from my mistakes. I did learn some things that I could help maybe some young man learn today. Maybe help our grandchildren, our children, amen, do something for them. So, Dad, here's a few nuggets. I'm going to give you about three of them and a bunch of stuff under But first of all, uh, refrain. Teach them refrain. Teach them what it means to, to have control. Amen. We're living in a day and age where everybody's on some kind of pill or this or that or the other, and they have excuses for why they blow their top, they, 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 why, they, why they can't control themselves. I've got anger issues. Who don't have anger issues? Everybody's mad today, amen? But that doesn't give you the right to just blow your stack all the time and continually and we need to teach our children how to refrain themselves. Do not allow them to just blow their stack all the time. And you say, well, how do I teach them that? With that, I'm glad you ask. Control yourself. Amen. If you are constantly blowing your stack, losing your marbles, slinging stuff, Raising your voice and screaming and hollering at them for everything. You are giving them permission to lose control when they get upset. You do it. And if it's okay for you to do it, it must be okay for me to do it. So when you get mad and you start throwing wrenches and you start throwing stuff and, and getting aggravated and, and lose your cool and that kid's watching you, well, when he stumps his toe or when he, when he runs into the wall or he does something, how's he going to respond? The same way he saw you. You are teaching them how to control themselves when you control yourself. Amen? Most dads have no filter today. They just pour out of their mouth whatever comes out and they don't even think about what they're saying and what they're doing when they do that in front of their children. Teach them to refrain from certain things. Not just uh, outbursts and angry attitudes and, and stuff, but to refrain from foul language. You don't have to cuss. You know, that cussing does not make you look bigger. A foul mouth does not make you look intelligent. I mean, you go around and you go to cursing and using foul language in public and in front of people and in front of your children, in front of your wife and, and that stuff. Does that, do you think that makes you look any bigger or badder or tougher? No, it just makes you look simple. Ignorant. It does not. Wouldn't it make your mama proud? Don't you know the Lord is just proud of you? Yeah, that's one of my kids. I saved them years ago. Look at him go. And there's another thing that you don't do. You don't laugh at a kid when he blows his stack. I've actually witnessed that. Now, now, now I have to admit, now, I, when I'm saying kid, I mean when the kid's old enough to understand. Now, I've seen an infant lose a toy and just, <laughs> no, that's hilarious. Because I know if he's bigger, he'd kill me. I mean, that, there's enough rage in a little kid from the get-go. Amen? You take the passy out of the mouth and you watch him. The only thing keeping that kid from killing you is he's not able to yet. <laughs> Amen? And that's the truth. The most violent thing on the earth is an infant. Just thank God they're not strong as we are when they're born. Amen? You wouldn't be able to control them. They are what you teach them to be. They're arrows, according to the Bible. You remember we talked about that? And they're going to go where you aim them. And if you aim them down the road with a filthy mouth and lying and cheating and stealing and drinking and all that, guess what? They're watching you. You're aiming them. Because they're going to line up right behind you. And when you fall over, they're going to keep going. Amen. That's the truth. They want to make you proud. They want to please you. But, according to your words, they're never good enough. Always putting them down, always belittling, always demoralizing them, always, always picking on them. Well, I'm just picking on them. I'm just trying to make him tough. Are you trying to make him tough or are you just driving him to anger? Provoke not your children to anger. 
Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. We talked about that one week. Don't embarrass them when you correct them. Don't, don't punish them in public for things they did in private. Now, the reason I say that is, when you punish a kid, the kid ought to understand why you're punishing him. He ought to understand what it's for. That you ought to make sure they know why you're punishing them. The, you know, it's like I, I, some people some people beat their dog when it does wrong. Their dog did something wrong and then gets it home and beats it. Or they, they take it and they beat the dog. The dog has no clue why it got beat. It just knows it got beat. And the same way for a kid if you don't tell them. Make sure they understand what that punishment's for before you dish it out. Amen? But anyway, don't do it in public. Now, there is a, there's a catch there. If your kid is misbehaving and excessive and won't listen to you and continues to test you in public, then correct them in public. But if they misbehave in public, tell them to calm down. And then you can talk to them and deal with it later. But don't, 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 don't embarrass them in public. You say, why do you say that? Because you're just anger them. You've embarrassed them in front of their friends. You've embarrassed them in public. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to have vengeance in their heart. They're going to have anger and bitterness. And the next chance they get, they're going to embarrass you in public. That goes on continually. And people don't seem to catch on. Proverbs 21. Look at Proverbs 21. In Proverbs 21, verse 23. In Proverbs 21, verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. A lot of times uh, uh, you, you need to learn to refrain. You don't have to say everything that goes through your mind, Dad. You don't have to say everything that goes through your mind, Mom. It still applies. You can, moms can, you can still glean some things from this. Just because... Uh, uh, the kids upset you and you want to say something. You don't have to say something. Think about it before you speak. We need to learn to think about how we're going to word things, especially with our younger kids. We, that's the age that they are very, very uh, moldable. We can make them. We can shape them. We can kind of aim them where we want them to go. And if we're not careful with our words, we can hurt them. The same words can build them or can break them. Picture it like this. Your words are like a hammer. Your words is like a hammer. And when you talk to your kids, are you beating them down, beating them over the head with your words, just tearing them down, just, just, just knocking them down, tearing down their self-esteem, tearing down their, 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 their morale, just tearing them down where they have no confidence in themselves anymore? Or are you taking those, that same hammer and building them up? Every time a kid messes up, doesn't always mean they need to spank him or they need correct him. A kid sometimes messes up, you ought to say, there's another opportunity to teach him. He, there's another opportunity to teach him. I thank the Lord that every time I mess up, that he don't just reach down from heaven and smack me down. Amen. I thank the Lord that every time I fall short or don't do something just like it should be done, that, that I'm not dodging lightning bolts where he's mad at me throwing them down. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I thank the Lord he's patient and long-suffering. Amen. 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 And he's a good father. And if you want to know how to be a good father, look at the Bible and how he treats you. Look at the father and how he treats you. Amen. And do the same for your kid. Do you love God the Father? Amen. Amen. Right. Do you fear him at the same time? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Amen. They should fear your wrath, but they shouldn't fear you. They should know you love them. There, there's a difference. I gave the illustration one time about spilt milk and seeing somebody slap their kid just unreal, accidentally spilt. They got him a glass of milk for dinner out in public, and he accidentally spilled it trying to reach for it over his plate. That it was set too far from him, and when he reached it, he, he didn't get his hands around it good, and he spilled it. And the dad reached over there, smacked him on the back of the head, 
and embarrass that kid, had him crying, and then was making fun of him for crying in public. And I seen that kid's face, the anger in that kid's face. And that verse, provoke not your children to wrath, came to mind. And that's exactly what he did. That kid will never forget that. Right. Just like that slap to the back of the head, Dad, your words are like a hammer. Sometimes what you say to them, they will never forget. The times you call them stupid or worthless or, or they'll never amount to nothing will tear them down and they'll, they'll, they'll have problems with their life from a lot of that stuff. Sometimes we need the life over the spilt milk. Sometimes we need to take it as an opportunity to teach them we're going to mess up from time to time, but we go ahead and own up to it. We go ahead and, and life through it and we <coughs> learn from it. Amen? Teach them how to control themselves by controlling yourself. Don't lose it every time. Learn some restraint. Learn to refrain from some things. Uh, again, I didn't go there, but we, we, we could, there's going to be a lot more that could be said on each one of these points, but I'm just going to keep moving. But we should refrain from a lot of things. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, Anything that would pollute their mind, their heart, their body, we should, we should refrain from them because they're going to watch us and they're going to follow us. Right. Number two, respect. Teach them respect. What has happened to good old-fashioned manners? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. What's wrong with calling their teacher Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so? And now listen, most of you know my wife calls me Jimmy. When I was a little boy, uh, my, uh, my name is James, and, and, and Jimmy's the nickname that they gave me. And I went by Jimmy all the way up till I started public work. When I started public work, I filled out my name as James Ray Keever. And they seen it on the application, and they said, okay, you can start Monday, James. And I went to work, and everybody called me James. And I've been James my whole adult life. And the way you can tell how well somebody knows me is by what they call me. My wife, my daughters, well, not my daughters, my wife calls me Jimmy, my daughters call me Daddy, amen? You say, well, well, what do we call you, Jimmy or James? Neither. You call me preacher, you call me pastor. You don't go in a courtroom and, 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 and holler out the judge's first name and wave at him, do you? Has nothing to do with me thinking I'm better than you. It has nothing to do with me, th me being arrogant or full of pride. It has to do with respecting the position. Yep. And in respecting the position, when a judge walks in the room of the courtroom, everybody in the courtroom stands up. The lost world demands respect for certain positions. It's Mr. President. Or it's President Trump. Or Tre President Bush. It's never just... Donald Trump, or Obama, or, you, you know what I'm saying, or George Bush, or whatever. You, you, you give them the respect of the title that they have earned. Amen? It's not the man that you're respecting, it's the position. And in respecting that position yourself, you're teaching your kids. You're in the courtroom. You went in there just to witness the courtroom. Maybe a family member got in trouble. I don't know. Maybe a friend. Maybe you're in trouble. Amen. But anyway, you're in the courtroom. Your kids is in the courtroom with you. And the judge walks in and everybody stands up. The kid automatically knows there's something different about that guy in that position. And they've learned to respect that position without saying a word. No one's had to say anything. They realize that's somebody that we need to respect. That position is a position we need to respect. We call the governor, governor so-and-so. Why? Because you're to respect that position. He can be an idiot, but you still got to respect that position. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It's the position that demands respect. Amen? Amen? Now, you're teaching them 
manners. Teach them to respect the police, respect their teachers, respect the pastor, respect authority. Never let a kid disrespect you. You are in the place of authority in their life. If you allow them to constantly disrespect you or disrespect your spouse, guess what they're going to do at work? They're going to disrespect their boss. Guess what they're going to do in society? They're going to disrespect the police. Guess what they're going to do when the preacher tries to help them? They're going to disrespect him and God. He is not going to be or she's not going to be able, uh, willing to follow anybody. Why? Because you've allowed them to disrespect you. Never allow them to disrespect you. Teach them to respond with respect to authority. You know that help a lot of our kids today instead of running down the police all the time and letting them listen to the TV, run down the police all the time and belittle the police all the time. It'd do them good. Amen. To hear something good about the police and everything and respect the police. Amen. A lot of the crime we have now is because no one respects the police or authority. Amen. Several years ago, there was a, there was a, I can't remember exactly when it was, but there was a, uh, a riot and a bunch of people went out and, the tel and of course the news crew, they love going out there and they love filming it, especially if they can push their agenda in the situation. And the news crew was there, and there was a black woman. I have more respect for her than most Christians. Some of you know what I'm talking about when I say it. A black woman was caught on camera going up to her son, recognized her son in that mess, and she told him not to go down there, not to be a part of it, and he went down there. She went down there and got him. I mean, he was telling her, she was smacking him, telling him, get your butt to the house. I mean, she, I said, whoo, boy, I tell you what, more mamas should have been out there. Right, amen. More daddies should have been out there, amen. Right, right. That is demanding that they respect authority, demanding that they do what they're supposed to. Don't run them down. Don't teach them disrespect out of your mouth. You come home, you constantly disrespecting and running down the boss man. What do you think they're going to do when they get a job? They're going to look for fault in the boss man so that they have something to talk to you about. Yeah, my boss man did this and this and this and this. I mean, I sit and listen to it. I've heard people talk. I know what I'm talking about. That's what goes on. Teach them to respect. Refrain from lying. Make them tell the truth. If they tell a lie and you catch them telling a lie, make them go to the person they told it to and, and make it right. Just like stealing. Don't allow them to steal. If you catch a kid stealing, that'll be the happiest day of your life. If you catch, if you catch a little four or five year old take something in the store, that ought to be the, one of the happiest days in your life. Why? Because you've got an opportunity to teach this kid something. What is it? What is it? You teach them they're not to steal. How do you do it? You take that kid back down to the store and you make them return it and you make them apologize for it. And ask if there's anything they can do to compensate for it. You want them to sweep the floor? You want them to clean the window? You want them to do something to, to pay for the trouble that they've caused? You teach them not to steal. Just like you teach them not to lie. Here's another one. The last one. I'll give you this and we'll go home. Number three. Oh, there's so much more I can say under each one of these. But but we are getting kind of long on these. This is the seventh week in seventh week that we've dealt with it. But anyway, responsibility. And man, I could camp out right here. Teach your kids responsibility. But before you can teach your kid to be responsible, guess what? Dad, you need to start being responsible. Amen? Amen. You're responsible for the home. You're responsible for the atmosphere in the home. Your home is what you make it. If your home is full of fussing and cussing and fighting and feuding, it's your fault. It's your fault. You choose it. You don't have to participate in it. You must like it or you wouldn't keep doing it. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you don't want to fuss, you know how to stop it? Zip it. It's real easy to fix. It's real easy to end argument. Walk away. But no. Our pride won't let it. Let us, will it? We've got to have the last word. We've got to have the last dig. We've got to have the last thing. That's that flesh in us, amen? That's that wicked, sinful flesh. 
Sometimes we need to die to our pride, let the wife win the argument, and let it go, especially if the kid's there. If your home's full of fussing and fighting, guess what your kids is learning? That's normal. That's what marriage is like. That's the way it should be. Moms and dads should be fussing at each other. Moms and dads should fuss over money, should fuss over this, should fuss over the car, should fuss over everything. I grew up in a home like that. And I said I wasn't going to grow up in a home like that. Me and my wife got married. We put our money together. I told her, I said, what's mine, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine is ours. No longer can we claim it. I said, when we make any money, we put it in there. I don't care if you put more than me. I don't care if I put more than you. It's our money. And that's the way we've been. People don't do that today. They separate their money. and Oh, they think that's the worst thing in the world, the preacher talking about putting your money together. You know what we, you know what's done for us? We don't fight over money. I went out to eat some, with somebody one time, uh, a married couple. When I was just a young man, I went out to eat with them one time. I'd done something for him on his card and done something for him, worked for him. And he wanted, uh, he wanted to just buy me dinner. I told him he didn't owe me anything. We said, at least let me buy you dinner. And he got his wife and we went and sat down to eat. And, he, and they were sitting there. They were going to buy my dinner. And right in front of me, they began arguing over who was going to pay the bill. Well, I bought the last time. Well, I got the grocery. Well, I think the power bill. Well, the water bill was crazy because you had to wash everything with that old pressure washer you bought without telling me. And, 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 and it was a, I was embarrassed for them. <laughs> and I made up my mind right then. I'm not going to argue over paper. I'm not going to let it ruin my marriage. And me, me and Angie don't argue over money. It's real easy. We don't have nothing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know me, though, I will tell you, I am working on my second million. I really am. I'm working on my second million. They told me it was easier, so I gave up on the first. I'm working on that second one. They said it was easier, so that's what I'm going for. <laughs> you say, preacher, you're crazy. No, I'm just having fun, but I'm telling the truth. Amen. Here's one. Now, dads. I, I'll tell you how you can lose it. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. So how can you do that? You just said to refrain and not lose your cool. You can have control and be angry. Well. There's some things we should get angry at. Sin should make us angry. Rebellion should make us angry. Disobedience should make us angry. There's some, this society basically should make you angry nowadays, amen? TV should make you angry. The news should make you angry. There's some things that should make you angry, but you need to teach them how to be angry and still maintain control, still exercise that restraint that I was talking about. And when your kids is little, they're going to give you opportunities to teach them this and how to do that. When your kids get a little older, they're going to start riding bicycles and they're going to start having little, little, little toys and stuff. And most all dads has got a little toolbox. I got a big toolbox. I used to be a mechanic. That's the only reason why I was a mechanic for years. So I got a big toolbox. Let them borrow your tools. And you know what you're going to find? Your drawers is empty. Yep. You had all your wrenches laid out. You got your metric over here, your standard here. You got your, you got your uh, uh, crescent wrenches back there. You've got all your specialty wrenches over here. There's a distributor wrench. It just works on one car one year, just about. You know? I mean, you got all everything laid out so you know where it is. And when you need something, you go to the drawer and you slide it open. And it looks like a tornado went through that drawer. And you go to look at them, where's my wrenches? I understand anger. <laughs> you go in the house and you can't with a firm voice tell you, hey, where is my tools? I don't care that you borrowed them, but I want to know who borrowed them, where is it at, and why didn't you put it back? You've taught them it's okay to be angry, but you also taught them you can be angry without cussing, without, without sinning, and you understand what I'm saying? Too many times, Dad, we missed that opportunity. We went in there ready to rip their head off over a wrench out of place. Now, you know how many times I have went to the drawer and opened it up and a wrench not be there? And I was the one who used it last. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to rip his head off and show him how to be ugly when he does it. But when I do it, I'm sitting there thinking, where did I use that thing last? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I never put, never put wrenches and sockets and stuff in my pockets. I always would set them down or set them on the toolbox or I had a little cart that I dragged down around beside the vehicles and stuff like that. Most of the time they was under the hood. But I'll never forget one day, I put a wrench in my pocket. Just out of character, not normal. You would think I would feel a wrench in my pocket. But I did not. And I looked for that thing all day. I borrowed somebody else's. I went out and looked at the car I'd worked on before. I went outside where I'd parked it and popped the hood and the flashlight looking all under it. I walked around in the parking lot looking for this wrench and it's in my pocket the whole time. You say, when did you find it? At the end of the day when I finally reached in there to take a rag and it was in my pocket out. And I said, what's that? <coughs> How many times have you fussed at your kids? For something you thought they lost, you showed them how to be ugly. You showed them how to be mean. And it was the remote control, and you was the last one to touch it. Mm. Mm. You missed an opportunity to teach them a lesson. There is a great lesson you can teach them. What is that? You can teach them some responsibility. You can say, son or daughter, if it's something in the kitchen or the sewing kit or, or scissors or whatever girls do, I, I don't know, maybe it's a rolling pin. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever, whatever it is, you have an opportunity though. You go looking for it and it's missing. You realize that's where you left it and you realize one of them has done it. You go to them and tell them, just be honest. Who's, the last, who, who's in the drawer? Who used it? And when they tell you, say, okay, where'd you leave it? Now, you know what you did wrong? You've got an opportunity to teach them to be responsible. If you borrow something from somebody, you respect it. It's theirs. It may be just old junk to you, but it's important to somebody else. The one that owned it. The one that, the one that bought it. And if you want to do right, if you borrow something, you should ask first. If you want to do right, if you borrow something, you treat it with respect and you take care of it. If you borrow something, don't take it back dirty. How many of you ever went to get something and, and somebody borrowed it and they put it back nasty? Or they put it back broken and didn't say anything? That's not responsibility. If you borrow something from somebody, you ought to treat it with respect. If you borrow a car from somebody and it's got a half tank of gas, you ought to fill it up when you get it back to them. If, if you borrow a car from somebody and it's clean when you get it, it ought to be clean when it goes back. I, I remember one time in particular, I'd got me a small trailer and I was, uh, it was just a five by ten, just a little utility trailer, just a haul, uh, a little lawnmowers and stuff like that on. I had one and it was a wood bottom on it and I put a new bottom on it and the, the tongue of it was kind of messed up where it goes over the hitch, you know. And I said, so I took the time, cut that thing out, bought a new, new receiver, put it on there, bored it through. I mean, had to drill the holes, bolted it on there, and welded it on there, rewired the thing. This trailer was nice. Now, it had a little tilt bed on it. It was a nice little trailer. Now, I fixed it up. I went through and packed the bags. And a buddy of mine wanted to borrow it. I thought, right, go ahead yeah, get it. So he come over, he gets it with his truck, and he's going to borrow it for a little bit and bring it back. He just needed it for a week. Well, a month went by, and I still hadn't got it back, and I fixed it for a reason. I needed it. I wanted to use it for a reason, you know. So I had to call him. Poor character, not responsibility, not taking responsibility. So I called him, and he said, well, I can bring it back such such time. I said, okay, that'll be fine, but I'm not going to be here, but you, you can drop it off, and, and, and it, that way it'll be here when I, when I get back, I can use it. When I get back, this trailer that looked brand new was just covered in filth and nasty. Looked like he drove it down through a mud hole. I mean, it was just terrible. Stuff still left in it, just the trash where it didn't even... 
I, I was surprised it didn't bounce out going down the road or blow out going down the road. There's so much stuff in it. And that wasn't the bark stopping. That brand new tongue I put on there <clears throat> was twisted so bad I had to beat it down on the ball and I had to take a pry bar and pry it off the ball. What he had done, he had jackknifed it backing up because he didn't know how to back up and it had twisted it. And it made it hard to get on and off. And I had it welded on there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It had been all right if it had just been bolted on. I could have took it off easy. But that ain't even the worst part. You say, what's the worst part? He didn't say a thing about it. Had he told me, hey, I messed up, it wouldn't have bothered me. But the fact that he brought it when I wasn't going to be home, he dropped it off in that condition without saying anything, is poor character. That's not taking responsibility. Teach that kid to take responsibility. And you teach them to respect others and, and take responsibility by allowing them to use your stuff. One time, I'll never forget, Heather's husband, Heather's husband wanted to borrow a drop cord. Sure, go in there and get in the building. I told him where I hung it. I have them wrapped up. They've got a place they hang in, in my building. He went in there and he got that 100 foot drop cord. And it, I mean, I've had it for years. You know what I mean? For years. I've had it for years and years. I probably had it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I probably had it 30 years. And it's hanging in there still today. If I want it, I go get it in clean, light, nice condition. I could take it in the house if I needed to. You know what I mean? I went over there the next day. It had rained that night. He'd done something with it that day. It rained that night. And I went over there for some other reason, to do something for, for, my, for, for my daughter. And I went in, went over there, and when I got out of my truck, I seen something in the yard. And I walked over there. He had left it in the rain all night. And it looked like he had drove over it. And it was mashed in the mud. My drop cord. <laughs> That's my drop cord! I've had for years. See, it might be just junk in his eyes, but that's my 100-foot drop cord. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't respect it. He didn't bring it back. When I needed it, I had to go get it. Teach them to bring stuff back in a timely manner when they say they would. Now, this is me and Brother Murdoch's. We're old school, amen? This is just good respect and taking responsibility for stuff. Teach them to do that. The problem is today, they think everything's below, it's due them, they, you know, I deserve, they got this, 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 everybody should do stuff for me. You understand what I'm saying? They, they got this spirit of expectation that, or, or you should, I deserve it kind of attitude. Teach them to work. Teach them to work. Teach them the value of a dollar. Do you know how to teach a kid the value of a dollar? Make them work for a dollar. Cleaning, your, cleaning their room should be expected. Well, I can give them chores to do. What's his chores? Clean his room. What else does he do? Cleans his room. When's the last time he cleaned his room? He did it last year sometime. <laughs> Amen. You still giving them a, you still giving them a, an allowance, but they don't do what they're supposed to do. You're not teaching them anything. Amen. Kids today is almost like a game to them to see how little they can actually do and get by with it. Teach them to work. Teach them to work. You know, in the old days, back when men had character and men respected people's things and people's belongings and, and, and respected mom and dad, when they took responsibility for stuff, they borrowed it, they took care of it, and saw to it, it got back in the same position. i tell you what I've done. I've borrowed something before. I borrowed a, a, a piece of equipment one time. The tires were, were slick and dry rotted, and I knew it when I borrowed it. So I was real careful with them. But guess, guess what happened when I had it? It blew out. One of the tires blew out. Instead of using that equipment 
for what I wanted to do that day. You know what I got to do that day? I got to take the uh, tracks off of that skid steer by myself. Go out in the middle of the woods and jack a skid steer up and get that wheel off in the middle of the woods where I was at. Then go get my truck and ride around and find someone to, who, would, who would sell me a skid steer tire, get it put on, then go back into those woods, put it on that thing, put those tracks, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, them things is heavy. They're extremely heavy. In fact, I had Angie come up there and help me or I wouldn't have got them on. I was using my little tractor uh, and, the front, and the front loader just to help get the weight up so I could get the bolts back in that thing. But you say, how much did it cost him? It didn't cost him a dime. It cost me. It broke on me. I was using it another time. You say, well, what do you do now? I don't use that anymore. I used it another time. And I was sitting in there, and this is no lie. I was sitting in there, and I was raising the bucket up, and all of a sudden I heard, Poof! and man, the lines, one of those high-pressure lines, hydraulic lines, where it was lifting that, raising the loader up, the bucket up, when that thing went up, that line busted, and there was a perfect outline of me. When I got out and looked back, you could see wet all around this silhouette where I was sitting. You know why? Because the whole front of me was covered with it. So what was I doing that day? I was in the middle of the woods with a broke down skid steer again, trying to get that line off. And then I was going to find somebody to make me a high-pressure line to replace it. How much did it cost him? Nothing. He let me borrow it. It broke on me, so I took care of it. I was one using it. I was using it for me, so I took care of it. You say, well, you shouldn't do that. Yes, I should. It would have cost me a lot more to have rented a skid steer for the day mm -hmm. and do what I was doing. In my eyes, I still got out good. And when he got his equipment back, he got it back with new grease fittings and everything greased where he'd never greased it. It was obvious. You know what I mean? He got a new tire back, got it back with a new tire and new pressure hose, both hoses, by the way. I wasn't taking a chance on going through that again. <laughs> Amen. There was two hoses right there together and I replaced them both. That's just being, having some character and taking responsibility for your mistakes. You know what the Lord says for us to do? Turn to 1 John. I, I'm closing here. Turn to 1 John. 1 John 1 9, you know it. If, if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. Do you know what you have to do in order to do that? You have to take responsibility. You have to own up to the fact that you've done wrong, that you messed up, and you have to confess it. Right. Yeah. That's taking responsibility. Amen. Amen. Teach them that. Teach them to work. Teach them uh, the value of dollars. In the old days, you know what they used to do? Kids used to gather the egg, milk the cow, clean the barn, and gather, help gather fire, firewood in. And you know what the results was? Men of character. Today, you know what they have to do? Play games. Watch TV. Do they have to do anything? And we wonder what's wrong with our kids. Work them. Amen? You say, preacher, that's awful, that's terrible. No. Out of hands is the devil's workshop. Their heads is full of violence and full of filth because they sit around and watch it and play it all day. Get them outside where they get some fresh air. Amen. Amen. Get them outside where they can get some exercise and do something. You say, well, I don't live in a farm. I live in a housing development. Plant you something on the porch. Do something to get them outside. And get them to do something. Amen. I shouldn't say this, but I will. I... One of our daughters one time was, was homeschooling and Angie was having trouble with them teaching them the time. They were struggling with the time. You know, at, at, nowadays everybody's got the digital watches and the Apple watches and all this stuff now. 
But in order, when you're teaching them, you teach them how to tell time by the hands. Amen? How to tell time. And what I was struggling with that. And I don't know why, but I remember struggling with that when I was young. So I was going to help them too, you know. But, 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 but she had messed up. She had misbehaved and she had done something bad. And back talking stuff. And, and her punishment was I had a bunch of rocks delivered. Some of that riprap, you know what I'm talking about? I had a bank over here, and I was going to put them rocks on that bank. I said, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to correct you and help you at the same time. I'm going to hang this watch in this tree, and I want you to carry them rocks for 30 minutes. You just take them from that pile and throw them over there. And I was mowing the yard like a watcher. And she did it. She was Oh, it's amazing. They won't do what you told them to do originally, but when you punish them, they'll do that. <laughs> hey, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. You say, don't mess with that, and they keep messing with it, and then you say, go to your room. They'll go to the room. I'm like, it'd been easier to listen the first time. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, she was doing it, and this is how honest she was. She went up there, she forgot what time she started, and she went up there and looked at the watch, and she went over time. And I was sitting there thinking, should I say anything or should I let her learn this lesson? <laughs> so I let her go till she, till she decided to stop. Amen. I bet you to this day, if you give her 30 minutes to do something, she knows exactly how long it'll take her. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> she knows how to tell 30, 30 minutes. Amen. That's real easy time to figure out there. But anyway, let's teach our kids some things. I know this one was a little different. But we do need to learn to teach them some restraint to refrain from just blowing their top all the time. We need to teach them respect by being respectful ourselves. And we need to teach them some responsibilities. How? By being responsible and, and taking our responsibility seriously as well. I'm going to ask you if you can close your eyes.